Hi, welcome to my intimate series, Heart and Craft, where I talk to independent artists about the struggles that all artists face. Uh, I figure that if we can share our stories about how we as individuals meet these obstacles, maybe we can learn as a, as a community to move forward and uh, help each other better to reach that goal and reach our audience. Uh, so this time around, it's uh, David Wilde, a Scottish filmmaker I met a long time ago online. Um, he's a uh, funny, pragmatic guy who gets the job done. He uh, he is a, an actor. I'll let him tell his own story. Um, but uh, basically, I find talking to him very entertaining, very refreshing. It was great to catch up with him again. And uh, I think you'll enjoy what he has to say. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, David Wilde. David, thank you for being here. Thank you for making this happen. No, thanks for, um, thanks for asking me on, man. Appreciate it, you know. I mean, the... Uh, I mean, we'll get to chatting in a bit, but the, the point is that when I think of you, I think of like somebody who uh, makes their art happen. It's, it's you don't ask for permission; you just do it. I, don't, I don't know if all, I, all obstacles. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I call it art, but, um, but yeah, I, I'd like to be um, more prolific than I am, but I'm trying to get to that level. You know. Um, I mean, it's, it's your name over the, the door, though. Like when you make something, it is you, and that's that's the best part of it. It's not like you're. Uh, you, you, your days of well, I mean, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself, but the the point yeah. is that uh, you, you're I find you inspiring, so you know that's why you're here. <laughs> so, no, I appreciate that, man. Appreciate it. You know. Um, um, so, so I mean, let's uh, a bit of context though. I I I actually don't remember how I met you. I, I don't remember where we first started interacting. Well, I I just remembered uh, when you sent me the email that we actually met in Glasgow a few years ago. Oh yeah, um, but, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. The first time we connected, I think it was. I mean, you backed a few, a few of my productions, um, oh, so I think right, it, yeah. I think it was that way over the years, the very early yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah. I think it was that. You know, because it was it was before Crime Lord. You you were doing. I think you were just yeah. getting up for Crime Lord when we when we met face to face. I think the I think the first one was probably Mission X, and then maybe the US one screen. I don't know. But, you oh know. no, no, right. Yes, I got. Yes, I got. The, I've got the DVD of that. Of, of, of That's Mission what it would X. be. Yeah, that was just yeah. quite a way back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. that was fun. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, so, yeah. so, tell us for people who don't know, though, can it give us a wee bit of your your backstory? What got you into film? Um, to, well, to brief summarise, I started off trying to um, started off doing a bit of acting, and then I was always trying to um, get an extra line here and there. So I frustrated filmmakers. Um, cut long story short, come back to Scotland. I was in London, come back to Scotland, and it was at the time when movies weren't really made. There was no DSLRs. There was no there was no fucking internet. I mean, you know, there was no. Um, sorry, I'm swe- I don't know if you can swear on this podcast, but um, I've. I've I watch. I, I watch I, my. You know. I'm. A, if I have an audience at all, I don't think they'll mind about swearing. <laughs> right. Okay. But um. Yeah. I, I got an industry. Uh, I put a play on, and then I went after a budget for a film, which was about three hundred and fifty thousand. The typical industry route. Um. The sales agents, the distributors. Um. Got a budget together. Went to America and made a comedy movie, but there was too many cooks on it. There was too many. Mm-hmm. You know, I think this is why when, you know, your guys like Christopher Nolan and Robert Rodriguez, when they made their first movies, they made them with like seven grand so they could control a vision. When you make your first movie with 300 odd thousand, you don't really have anything to show. So everybody's putting the bets on, they're taking their bets off, they're taking them. Before you know it, you end up with a movie made by committee, which is fine if it's a hundred million movie. But when Mm -hmm. it's a movie that's costing three. 350,000 and there's a lot of cooks it doesn't become the movie you want so cut a long story short I made the movie didn't like it hated it pushed it out there got other offers I just had a bad experience with the business and I was green I didn't know how to deal with it like I could deal with it today you know so I, I never made a movie again for like probably 8 years um, I wasn't I wasn't even interested wasn't even interested you know really um, but if it's in your DNA it never goes away you just self-destruct if you're not creative, <laughs> so probably in those eight years, wow. I was cu- I was coming to the end of life, you know. <laughs> so that was the fu- that was the first experience, really, you know, kind of industry route, you know. Yeah, but that's and uh, right, but that that really does like answer a couple of questions after that. Like, so you were dis- yeah. discouraged by like the, the the traditional ways of doing things, like this this bottleneck. I just talked to a friend who who finished a film, but like the people who were funding it just became sort of monsters and had a stranglehold on the on the film even though it was done and sort of already out in the world i mean that's what you wanted to avoid then right 
Yeah, well, I was inexperienced. I didn't really know much about that. that was I'm, I'm totally experienced now about it, and I know how movies are made and how they run by committee. And if you're going to agree to make a movie, you're doing it for this reason, you're doing it for that reason. I'm much more mature. Um, but at the same time, people like to put their fingers on things just because they've got their fingers on it. You know, mm. even though it's creatively not the right decision, so that if it becomes a hit, they've got their finger on it and they say that they touched it. And then if it flops, mm. they've not touched it enough to get any blame, you know. Right. So there's people constantly putting their fingers on, you know, and pushing things and changing things, even though they don't know why they're doing it. Instead of, so that experience, even though I was green, really, really put me off. Um, I think it was like I met Robert Rodriguez on a TV show when I was doing the circuit and that. And then mm. I read his book, and it made me realise as well, just start making movies a small way first to get control, to get a vision, so you know how to write, produce, control it. So that if one day you're after a budget, then you can kind of show you've got some sort of vision that you probably get more creative control. Um, mm -hmm. But saying that, there's big directors in the world, whether, you know, Neil Marshall working on Hellboy or whatever, get the creative control taken away from them. You know, so it's that type of business. You know, you've just got to find right. your way through it, you know. Um, so what brought you back? Um, I think if it's just in your DNA to be creative um, and you're a bit masochistic as well and a bit... Uh, I think I saw the technology. You know, the technology was obviously getting better when we just talked about a film called Mission X. Right. And everybody was making um, found footage movies at the time because there was no DSLRs to get a nice sort of film look. So mm -hmm. like found footage movies. So I made a, a found footage movie. But I wrote it and I produced that one because the first one I directed and I wrote it. But that one I produced it, wrote it, directed it. And I managed to get it into the cinema. They wanted to put it in. So I managed to buy bus bypass the distributors, but I couldn't get enough funding to make posters and stuff. Um, mm. So I just wanted to kind of control um, and make films the way I wanted to make them and learn learn to be a filmmaker, make all the mistakes, make all the screw-ups, make a lot of bad stuff and just do it so that you can learn your craft like any other creative craft. If you're a painter, you've got to do 100 paintings, but, you know, film's more expensive, of course, so you try. You have to do it very cheaply, you know. Right. Um, yeah, you know. I mean, I would think these. What was the, the the mistake that you learned the most from? You think in these early days? Uh, some of the obvious ones are like, first of all, technical mistakes. I always uh, treat sound more important than visuals at first. <laughs> Bad mm. sound, you know. Um, and the, the mistakes are. It's not even so much the mistakes. It's just learning to do the process. A lot of filmmakers want to be filmmakers and then go to Sundance and get awards before they're even qualified to be a filmmaker. So I think it's just fun. actually falling in love with the process, falling in love with making mistakes, falling in love with how to frame the camera, how to do this, how to make a film with a small crew. Because normally with your budget, you've got a team you collaborate with, but if you're making it DIY, you're doing a lot yourself. Um, so you've just got to get through those mistakes, which is almost everything, scheduling, lighting, sound. Be willing to make mistakes, to be willing to fall on your face flat. Um and you enjoy the process of doing that. Enjoy the process of failing, you know, um, as well. Micro fails. I, mean, I don't mean, you know, mortgage your house for a fucking movie. Do you know what I mean? Unless you're no, Francis like, Coppola, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, like we have those resources. No, a friend of mine had a, for some reason, had an entrepreneur friend. And my entrepreneur friend's advice was fail fast. You want to get yeah. to the failures so they can learn and do the next thing better as quickly Absolutely. as possible. Don't dwell Absolutely. on the failures. And that's yeah, make, here, yeah, make micro failures so that you mm -hmm. learn. You take quick punches fast. It doesn't disable you. It doesn't bankrupt you. So that you're just learning quickly. I think that's what I've been doing the last so many years, really. To be honest about it, you know. Um, I mean, uh, I'd like to talk. To, uh, well, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, sorry. Uh, no, no, I was going to say, uh, mission, so Mission X uh, was your your return because you couldn't not do it. It was was genre part of your decision to make that film. How much was genre yeah. Uh, producing? Yeah, choice? yeah, I think genre is always a part of it. Um, you know, if you look at some of the filmmakers that have been influenced by were, again, your Scorsese's, but your Roger Commons and uh, Roger mm -hmm. Corman had, you know, so genre was Abel Ferreira done the genre movie in the nineties, mixed with personal. So I think a mixture of personal mixed with genre, you know, mm -hmm. uh, has always been a subconscious sort of thing, you know. So that was. Uh, and I was playing, I, I think at Mission X, it was, I mean, it was a very, very rough, bad sound film. 
you know. Um, but I, I think you try to just put your personal stuff in there a little bit, you know, about people fighting their battles, but it's wrapped in a genre sort of story, you know, which is it's probably what I still do today, you know. You know. Um, I mean, tell me, actually, I didn't know about the, the cinema, the getting it on uh, large screens part. Like, what was what was the story with that? Did you forewall it? Or, I mean, how did you how did you do that? No, I, I actually just wanted to see that after my first movie, we were budgeting teams of producers. I wanted to see if I could make a film from the beginning to the end and actually get it in the cinema myself, right. you know. So I actually cut out distributors. It wasn't going to be a big release, whatever. So I thought... So I went to the cinema, and because you saw the poster with a guy standing in the lineup, they love the poster. This is it's a really striking poster. Yeah. We can see that in cinemas across Scotland, at least anyway. So if you can get us posters, and uh, but at the time there was no crowdfunding. Um, I didn't earn enough to. There was quite a few thousand. Well, it was maybe ten thousand, um, and there was a Scottish creative Scottish screen they called it here, and this is it wasn't a category for me. I said, well, I didn't ask you, get, but I never asked the money for the movie. I never asked for screenwriting money. I've actually made the movie and I've actually got it in the cinema, which is quite rare to happen. Mm-hmm. Or, but you don't fit into any criteria, which, anyway, cut on. So I never got the posters done. I never got it in the cinema. So I just, at the time, films were starting to go online with streaming, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, at that time. So I put it online. Um, I think actually some people took it. was a guy in America took it and he screened it at a drive in. You know, mm-hmm. um, and some people took it and screened it and took it and uh, went to DVD. But it was a learning cause. It was a learning film. It was just a learn. It wasn't. I was on. You know, wasn't going to say this is going to be a big film or take it to fucking mm. Sundance or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Because it was so much. There was a lot of faults in it that it wouldn't have passed quality control. You know, and oh. stuff like that. So, you know, what, um, what, was the, what was the budget for that one? You there was. I uh, don't. There. Uh, there was a specific someday. I was working at McDonald's at the time. I was really, really low on my fucking luck. I was 40 years old, working at McDonald's, and the, the cars at McDonald's were stopping. And they're saying, oh, you that guy made that, that movie, that first movie, because it was big in Scotland, my first movie. Yeah. And they says, oh, what are you doing here? How's it going? And I, I, had, a, I had a sticker that says, um, I'm loving it at McDonald's. <laughs> and uh, and it was I couldn't have been more fucking low. Cut long story short. Anyway, the guy that was the manager at McDonald's was a big fan of my first movie. He came in with a DVD to sign it. Wow. And he says, what are you doing next? I says, well, what do you think I'm doing? I'm cleaning the fucking car park, you know. <laughs> he says, well, he says, you get any ideas for movies? I says, well, yeah, I have. So I went up to a college to get a camera. He gave me a couple of grand. He invested a couple of grand. I had another thousand. So I think the budget started with 3,000. And I shot it over a year. I did it the old school way, uh, you oh, Robert yeah. Rodriguez and short weekends so, and evenings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was about a year it took um, for about three thousand quid or something like that. Do you know what I mean? To shoot it, you know. So, yeah, yeah. But that's great because then you found an international audience. <laughs> yeah, it's a small, you know. But it, um, it oh, just right, gave, yeah. it just gave me the, it just gave me the fire again to you know, oh, yeah. the fire, you know, um, you know. I mean, uh, what what happened? So what? So that was sort of like a, a shot in the dark. Then you're just seeing it, to, doing it to see if you could do it. That sounds. That's what it sounds like. And just and, seeing if you can do it and cut out some of the mid, the producers and and just actually because I had to do it, I was probably wasn't going to end up well, you know. Yeah. Um, which the characters were quite self destructive. The story it was about a guy with a battle with self as well. So that was the way that I was kind of like at the time. So it was a quite a cathartic thing. I just need to do this. Um, rather than thinking about I want to be a filmmaker, I want to be famous, why go to Sundance? It's, I just need to do this. Do you know what I mean? Which, but, uh, so did, but did this first film now? Like, so uh, my, what, what I'm getting at is, like, did you create a strategy after that? Did you see a path now? Or, or were you still... No, like, no? No, 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 that was too early because the internet was still very early days, you, you know, and technology was still early, but it was exciting that you could actually shoot something. It was exciting that you could actually get something online, promote online. So uh, I could see how that was probably going to grow online. So I thought, okay, if I only make small movies for the rest of my life, this might be a way to do it. You know, but I know that after the experience of the first film, I actually know nothing. Because everybody thinks when they make a film, they know everything. But then you realise over years how little you do know. Do you know what I mean? It's the best um, image. <laughs> Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so you realise um, it's a long path ahead. So 
this is who I am. I need to do it for better or worse, richer, poorer. So I, I think I can do this now on a small level and maybe one day I can get budgets and stuff, you know. So I mean, that was the sort of... I mean, jumping ahead to, to now. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, IMDb says your next thing is Mad World, but I know you're also doing like psycho sex dolls. I mean, is that what's, <laughs> the, what's the story with that? <laughs> everybody, everybody always says, "What's the story with psycho sex dolls?" Because it sounds like such a tr <laughs> trashy kind of um, John Waters type. Um, um, yeah, cut along to cut way ahead to that. I've made, been making films the last few years and features and a series and stuff. Um, and after you've been doing stuff for a long time, you realise that you don't want to. You get to a certain level when you, you know, you're trying to. You, you, instead of making work that you think will work with an audience, right? Yeah. You have to start making work that you just want to do, which sounds quite weird in a film with Psycho Sex Dolls, right? I wanted to do something that was well, really Well, it raises quite... some questions, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll be, I'll be honest. No, I'll, I'll, well, here's, here's how this came about quickly, right? Very quickly, because mm -hmm. it was only a few months ago. It was only a title a few months ago. Mm -hmm. I sat in one night. The Mad World was going to be an anthology series, like eight stories. Um, we had different stories in them, crime and horror. And Psycho Sex Dolls is one of those half-hour stories, you know, an antho anthology series about a guy with dogs, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when I put a Kickstarter thing up, like a pre-launch page, I realised I wasn't going to raise 80000 what I needed for it. So I never launched the campaign. I says, let me take one of these, these films and turn them into a feature. What can I turn into a feature? I don't want to do the crime thing because I've done crime for years. Do the horror thing, do the exploitation. Let me just take something fucking batshit crazy for a change and go the opposite way for crime. That people expect me to do that. I want to do something they won't expect me to do, you know. Um, not that anybody's fucking watching, but, you know, for myself, <laughs> for myself, for myself, just to, like, I always hear those quotes with David Bowie. He always says, go at the territory, get the water that you're, if you're comfortable, you're in the wrong place, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I wanted to be uncomfortable. So, Cut a long story short, I did the, the Psycho Sex Doll, come up with a title. I told a friend, and everybody I told the title, they laughed. And they went, what is, what's the story with that? <laughs> what is that? Right. It's true. Now, yeah. At least they got some sort of reaction. People weren't mm -hmm. still looking at their phones when you tell them. You know, they went, what the fuck is that? You know? so, oh. I got, so then what I did was um, I was playing a bit with AI. Everybody was talking about AI and the fears of AI and Hollywood's going to be AI. And I go, what the hell is AI? I don't even know what it is. So I found an AI program one night we are, and I, made, I after about a few days, I see I was trying to see if I could make an AI poster for this doll movie, you know, and I'd done all these doll faces, and some of them had ears and he two heads and shit, and then bang, one night this doll face came up, and it just looked so mad, and I put the title on it, and I went, there's the poster. I went back to the old school days of going to the Cannes Film Festival where yeah. Vic Bateman, who was a sales agent, says, David, get a poster and a fucking title. <laughs> Take me a simple, mate. Poster. You know, like the Ed Wood thing. Oh, yeah. Re reverse engineer. I says, I'm going to try some reverse engineer. Instead of just, I love, get this story. Because today when you go to Netflix, as we all know in Amazon, you get seconds, unless it's a Tom Cruise movie, you get seconds to sell it on a title and a poster. I thought, mm -hmm. if I could sell the movie on a poster and a title. So I got that. I go, okay, okay, what the hell is this movie now? But at the end of the time, I was starting to hear about the whole thing with Hollywood and AI. And a story started to come in my head about a filmmaker. I thought, I want to do a, a kind of personal film, but not just a filmmaker, it'd be too boring. Do be a trashy porno filmmaker that we come into the story when he's lost all his actresses because he doesn't pay them well. They make their own films now. He's, he's got a studio. His financer comes in there and tells him, you've got seven days to come up with an idea to make movies and get girls in here with, no, with a little money or the studio's closing everything. So... He's coming up with all these crappy ideas like Big Brother with tits or whatever the fuck. I mean, right? <laughs> right. But then he, he keeps getting this message for this AI company. It's got these dolls, these sex dolls. But the AI sex dolls are really different and he dismisses it. He ends up getting three beta testing dolls, three dolls, which is scary right away. They're beta, beta stage, you know? Mm -hmm. He gets the three dolls. They're really lifelike. They're like real women. They move and whatever. Of course... You know, how many finance does that starts to see money, you know, because it's, if they can make the films, as the story goes on, they start to make the films, they start to write the films, they start to take over. But his financer wants to put the dolls into clubs across the world and nightclubs and brothels. 
and make millions and of course one of the dolls is really intelligent she becomes more intelligent every single day and she starts to take over the other two dogs and mm. she sees what's happening and she doesn't want so it, it sounds like a really trashy genre movie but actually it's really a personal film about a filmmaker and a financer and the the, the draw between that and hollywood and it's got a mixture of all sort of personal stuff but it's wrapped it's wrapped in a very sort of strong, sensational genre like psycho sex dolls, you know. I mean, it's you know. got you know, it's it's like the trauma approach. It's like it's very uh, it, it is, but it's a, it, it is, but um, the the actors saw the script. I gave the actors the scripts. They went, Jesus Christ, this is a really good bloody script. What is it? Right. Really, the, the script is a really sort of solid foundation script. But the actual title and the poster sounds like a really so it invites you in the door. So it's, right. it does what it says on the tin. So you're going to get the type of people that watch it for the women. But once yeah. you get in the door, it's a different type of movie, you know. So uh, it, it takes a lot of boxes for me that way. So for me, it's an unapologetic way, actually making a personal sort of, really personal film, but encased in this, you know, Roger Common like you know, trashy-sounding film. And But I've got to the age where I don't give a shit if people think it's a porno, if people think it's this, <laughs> if people think it's that. And actually, I kind of like that if you think it's that. I actually, you know, I don't mm -hmm. want... I, I don't want to be... I've got no aspirations for awards. I've got no aspirations um, for to be accepted. I've got no aspirations. I just want to make the stuff that I want to make. Do you know what I mean? Oh, it, no, I mean, it's like... One of, one of these, so like I'm making this film about Jeff Minter and like my, one of my goals was, was to further my career. But the only way to do that with an indie film was to win an award at a film festival. And like, there's yeah. just gatekeepers everywhere. Like apparently yeah. I didn't, yeah. I didn't make a, sa a state sanctioned film. So nobody wants it. I'm like, oh, yeah. okay then. So I guess is that, that a, part's is, out. Is this a documentary you've done? Yeah. 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 So it was like Jeff Minter's this guy who uh, right. he has been making video games longer than anybody else right. on his own dime. He lives on a farm with a bunch of sheep and uh, he doesn't ask anybody's permission. So it's like that. I'm, I'm sort of drawn to those yeah. kinds of stories. Um, yeah, but yeah. the thing is, yeah. so but now that the video games industry in particular is is very entrenched with money. Uh, Jeff doesn't really represent that. In fact, he represents the opposite. So I get a wee bit of pushback on that, which is interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not like Jeff's gonna make a night, get a knighthood or anything. So, um, so yeah, uh, yeah. So like, I, I, uh, I don't know if you know who John Reese is. He did that book, uh, Bomb It, about uh, self distributing movies and uh, so yeah, I think, yeah, a few years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he runs a company, Eight Above, and uh, <laughs> brought him on board. So like he's sort of helping and guiding him through the process, and it's right. It's just, so basically, like, so you make the film, and that's like four years of effort and then you get you realize that you're at the bottom of a different mountain now and like distribution is like just the same amount of work but in a different direction and it's uh of course it is yeah yeah it's, it's interesting but it's it's new and but the thing is like, so you know me 10 years ago would have went ah fuck that but it's i'm sort of up for it now because yes yeah, yeah it's this or nothing really isn't it right if i don't get this film scene what was the point no um, i know i know and well that, that's back to my thing we are i think you have to We've all got different approaches. The way that I could, there's different approaches, but the one, there's several approaches in terms of filmmaking. I think you can either build a universe or work that you do, mm -hmm. and you can put work into that universe. It's almost like I've got stories I want to tell about Hollywood. I've got stories I want to tell about technology. I've got stories. I'm actually going to put them on in this genre, you know, um, mm -hmm. rather than make another film that probably nobody would watch. You know, okay. um, but my goal in the next few years is to get more in studio, more in ten thousand square feet studio, um, where I can make content, make films at the studio almost on a, a monthly, two monthly basis, and churn content, and churn films at, and have a way that the studio can earn money, revenue every month, okay. um, which can you know, we events and stuff like that, rather than making a film and get an audience in me. Because you learn over the years. You learn over the years the way to do it and the way not to do it. Do you know what I mean? Right. And it's very hard. But I think the one thing that we've got to do as well is build our own personal brands. You know, because, sure. I mean, if you look, if you look back in the days uh, when we, the filmmakers we loved, if you just say Abel Ferreira, Woody Allen, whatever, you don't, there's a lot of movies that I don't, there's a lot of filmmakers I like, but I don't like every one of the movies, but I like them. So, right. you know, I'll follow them, I'll watch them. Um, I think that's important as well, you know. And but if you if you know that they're pushing your own personal brand, and that's not your strengths, then you have to find where your strengths are and say, right, okay, I'm from behind the scenes. How else can I push? Do you right. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. um, I think definitely use 
But just to make it doesn't put it this way, it doesn't excite me just to make a film. I don't want to just make a film anymore. I can make a film for five hundred quid or thirteen grand. I just made that one for it's, that doesn't interest me. There's got to be a bigger plan over the next few years. Uh, where yeah. am I going with us? How am I going to yeah. build this? How am I going to build a brand? How am I going to sell? An example in cycle sex dolls, right? I've got posters. Some people have started to buy. And if when people buy posters, they buy the limited editions. They want one. Well, you know, there's a hundred editions of a certain poster, right? right? Because of the AI technology, rather than kind of complaining about it, I said, how can I use this? Well, the AI technology let me create one-on-one posters. That there's dogs, posters, mm-hmm. but they're, they're, there's, each one is completely unique, one-on-one. So some people have started to buy those posters at 200 quid each, do you know what I mean? But the movie's not even out there yet, so the time I get to the fourth movie, you know, Merchandise, posters, T-shirts, and stuff like that. But you've got to get the, the franchise going. And even if it's a small level, even if it's the global cult, if you can still make a living for that, that's really my sort of goal in build your own sort of studio. Otherwise, you know, I'm fifty seven. I'm fifty seven years old. I could die tomorrow, but I could I could be doing this for the next twenty years. Do you know what I mean? You know, oh, no, I mean, I'm 55 in you know, January. I'm not, I'm not very right. good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm ready to go when I'm going. I mean, when I'm I know, going, that's that. I'm going. But uh, as when long ring, as I'm ring the valley, you got to go. Oh, that's no, that, I, was thinking, I, remember, I remember reading a long time ago, like I think when like, when BitTorrent became a thing, like the, the in, in, a, in a world where like people can steal your stuff for nothing, how do you make money? And the idea is like, like, like you said, like you got to make these unique things that are adjacent to the film that you're making. The film, exactly. The film, exactly. The film, the film is the long tail, right? The film's gonna be around absolutely, driving absolutely, people to your absolutely. website. You'll make your your, your more money than a, a ten a twelve pound film Abs- ticket will get you. You have to just take it back to the way that uh, content creators are doing, like people that are on TikToks or whatever, they're building their audience and selling stuff. We have to do it in the same sort of way. I mean, this little film, I've made it in the sense that I couldn't cast uh, regular actresses in it, so I, cra- I, I cast three um, actresses that do adult content, right? Because it needed it for the story. You know, it's not right. a porn movie, but it's got scenes in it. Right. But if this movie goes out there, there'll be an edited version for Amazon Prime and Apple TV. Um, the Blu-ray. I'm blown away by people ordering the Blu-ray. I never thought people would order Blu-ray, but 50 percent of the people that bought it bought the Blu-ray. Pre- it's coming pre-ordered. back. That was the yeah. thing you hear about it. The Oppenheimer Blu-ray sold out. <laughs> So they yeah. had to make more. Oh, 50% of my Kickstarter backers are 50% want the Blu-ray, you know. Oh, yeah. So they're seeing the full version there. There's a digital download. They'll see the, the uncut version. Um, but so the film is too soft to go in, you know, uh, an adult site. It's too soft right. for that. But it's, it's too hard. But it's too hard to go on YouTube. So right. it can't be shared anywhere. So right. people, if they want to see it, if they want to see the director's cut, they've got to get the, the special download or they've got to get the Blu-ray, you know. So I, I can get it to the mainstream and I can get it as niche, you know. I think the, the niche thing is, um, and people are already asking about the sequel, the third one, the second one, so which I'm going to shoot in a few months, you know. All right, yeah. I hope you have, like, the same kind of success that, like, X did or, you know, um, Pearl um, and like that. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Ty, Ty West. Oh, Ty West. Ty. Ty West. Ty West, yeah, yeah. That I've seen the first one. I haven't seen. The, I haven't seen the second one. You know. Second yeah. one's way better. It's so it? good. It's really. Uh, was good. It, uh, I, the first one? I was a bit like, is that it? You know. Uh, nah, I no. expected oh, a bit more. One hundred percent agree. Yeah, and the second one was uh, like. Yeah. So I went to see it. It was like I went to see the first one with my buddy. And I went to the second one. My buddy was out of town. I'm like, I know he won't miss this. So go see it. <laughs> it blew me away. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, it's good. Right. Anyway, uh, um, uh, what, so. Uh, Thank you for your time. I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up now. But is, are there any last thoughts you have? Like, say, there's uh, I mean, if there's somebody coming up now who uh, thinks they're gonna be a, an indie filmmaker, and uh, what what words of wisdom? <laughs> you've, you've actually shared, you've shared a lot of wisdom right now. But I'm curious, you know, is there any last nuggets? Well, the, first, the, first, the first one is don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> And you know why I'm saying that. Um, um, oh yeah. But if you've got to do it, if you've really got to do it, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? It's a bad time, but it's a great time as well. That if you've just got to create and you create, but be prepared to do it for years. The, the, the biggest thing I've learned is be prepared to fall in love with the process there and be prepared to make it for the sheer love of it. Um, and even though it's grinding, you get through You get through a level. And whether you, you, you've, only have, you've only got a phone or a cheap DSL, it doesn't matter. Or what, you, you just have to create your. Yeah, I, I saw an interview with Ridley Scott the other day, and he said, "If you don't have this, if you don't have stamina, you're screwed. You need stamina. You need that fire in the belly, you know." Um, and I, I, hey, a way to earn the a day job to earn money as well, because 
you know, over the years, I haven't, I've, earned, I've not earned from filmmaking, I've earned from corporate videos, you know. Oh, that's, the, that's, that's the day job, corporate videos. But I don't love corporate videos. I could have built a corporate video business that was big, but I don't love it, so I don't put all my time into that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you have to do the 10,000 hour thing, you know, or, or more, a lot more than that, the 10 year thing, 12 year thing, 15 year thing, <laughs> you know. But you're not, but this is the thing, people say that you're not doing 10, 15 years. That's, that's almost like, oh, you're doing that so you can get to some place. This is the place. No, that's right. You have to enjoy the process of building and just hope one day as well, if you build that. Most people go to a job they hate and they're maybe earning 50k or 70k or less a year, right? If you can go to a job that you love and you're earning that and you do that for the rest of your life, I think that's the key for me, that you can love it, but you're mm -hmm. earning a decent wage. Where most people, a lot of people earn a wage, they don't love their job, but they still do it. So they make up with, you know, other vices, watching Netflix too much or booze or whatever, or, you know, I don't know, wearing weird sexy fucking clothes and, you know, <laughs> do getting weird shit, you know. We're getting yeah. back to $6, isn't Get back to $6, <laughs> <laughs> David Wilde, this has been magic. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thanks so much, Paul. It's been great catching up with you, man.